On the morning of December the 9th, 1930, a team of forensic experts and police arrived here at this cemetery in the village of Lewanik to begin the gruesome task of exhuming two bodies. It was the turning point in the investigation into a murder that had shocked and intrigued the whole country, involving a fake suicide, the extraordinary use of some reward money, and at the heart of it all, that most innocent and English of activities, a seaside tea party. The question at the heart of our story is, was the accused Annie Hearn a sweet-natured widow who fell prey to gossip and jealousy? Or was she a cold-blooded killer who wanted someone else's husband and quite literally got away with murder? The village of Lewanik, southwest of Launceston, is a small, close-knit community now as it was in the 1930s. Mrs. Sarah Hearn, known as Annie, lived at Tranhorn House in the nearby hamlet of Congdon Shop, where she cared for her elderly Aunt Mary and her older invalid sister, Minnie. Annie was an attractive widow in her forties, fond of jazz and dancing. The Roaring Twenties seemed to have passed her by. She was fond of telling friends how cruel life had been to her. She felt that her days had been deeply troubled with more than her share of grief. The two sisters, Annie and Minnie, and their Aunt Mary, had moved to Cornwall in 1921 from Harrogate in Yorkshire, where the sisters ran cookery classes. Annie and her relatives came from Yorkshire, and anyone who has spent any time at all in the north of England will realise that this is not the most clement climate for invalids. And they decided to move to Cornwall, uh, supposedly because this would be better for their health. And mysteriously, of course, this turned out not to be the case. Mrs Everard's health declined quite rapidly. She was suffering from gastric pain, she was suffering from headaches, she was having difficulties with her vision. None of which are the symptoms normally associated with the Cornish climate, I have to say. Aunt Mary died in 1926, aged 72, leaving all her worldly goods to Annie Hearn. The condition of Annie's sister Minnie continued to worsen. On July the 21st, 1930, she too died, at the comparatively young age of 52. The death certificate cited chronic gastric catarrh. Again, when the will was read, everything had been left to Annie. But when Minnie was on her deathbed, she complained somewhat curiously that her medicine tasted too strong. She was buried beside her aunt in Cornish soil in Lewanik churchyard. Annie Hearn, who had nursed both dead women, cultivated an air of mystery within the tiny Cornish community. The story was that she had married a medical student, Leonard Wilmot Hearn, in 1919 at a London registry office, but he deserted her after only a few days. Shortly afterwards, she would say, that she had read in a newspaper that her husband had died. When friends asked to see a picture of him, the photograph she chose to show them was subsequently discovered to be that of a total stranger. One, Lieutenant Charles Stuart Vane Tempest, who'd been killed in the Great War. Annie, it seemed, bought his photograph. A, a woman living by herself back in the 30s may well have felt under pressure to justify why she's by herself. So it's not unreasonable to think that she would make up a fictitious story to explain why she's alone. Whatever the custom of the time, this deception would later help to fuel doubts over Annie's character and behavior. In her time of grief over the deaths of her aunt and sister, Annie supported herself by selling homemade cakes and pastries, which she displayed in Trenhorn's capacious front window. The woman was also comforted by her neighbors, William and Alice Thomas, who lived at nearby Trenhorn Farm. In 
warm-hearted Alice would send occasional gifts to Annie of homemade Cornish junket and clotted cream. William Thomas was in the habit of lending Annie small sums of money. Loans, totaling 38 pounds, helped to tide her over the difficult financial period that followed her aunt and sister's deaths, which was probably innocent enough. Mr. Thomas was apparently financially self-sufficient. He never pressurized Annie to repay the money. And in any case, she had told him there was jewelry and family heirlooms that would eventually cover the debt. Later, a police superintendent would claim Annie admitted that Mr. Thomas used to come in every day with the papers, but of course, it were only a blind. An interesting triangle was developing between William, his wife Alice, and Annie Hearn. She was almost one of the family, even to the extent of joining them on the occasional outing in their car. One such excursion on Saturday, October the 18th, 1930, was to have murderous repercussions. William and Alice invited Annie to join them on a trip to the seaside resort of Bude, 20 miles away. Apparently, Annie agreed enthusiastically and volunteered to make some sandwiches, which they would have with a cup of tea in a cafe. To save, she said, making a flask. The idea of a cafe nowadays, allowing customers to bring along uh, their own food um, for a picnic and just to be supplied with drinks, in this day and age would be unheard of. It would be extraordinary. Um, but when you're looking at the social climate of the 1930s, you're looking at the early days really of days outings in motor cars. And I would imagine it's very new territory for cafe owners who are trying to encourage this new breed of tourists into their establishments. The trio wandered along the esplanade, taking in the invigorating sea air till it was tea time. Then they made their way through the town, window shopping as they went, before choosing a cafe in Bellevue, Bude's main street, one of the many that catered for the 1930s holiday trade. Annie unwrapped the sandwiches of tinned salmon and new crusty bread, arranging them in two piles of three and offering some of her homemade mayonnaise. Alice Thomas was the first to help herself. After tea, the women went for a walk, while William went to one of Bude's pubs, stopping for a whiskey or two. At this point, their day at the seaside took a decidedly downward turn. When the trio met again at the car, Alice complained of a sweety taste in her mouth. On the drive away from Bude at around 6 p.m. she became violently ill with stomach cramps and vomiting. William had to stop the car several times. Back at Trenhorn, Dr. Graham Saunders was called out from Launceston. He assured them it was just a stomach upset. He prescribed and left Kaolin medicine. Devotedly, Annie Hearn, ever the helpful neighbor, stayed overnight to nurse her friend Alice. In fact, she stayed for the next 11 days, cooking the food and giving the medicine. She had plenty of experience after all, caring for her elderly aunt and sister Minnie until their deaths. After a fortnight, the doctor considered Alice to be well enough to come down for a traditional Sunday lunch. Roast mutton and seasonal Brussels sprouts, prepared by Annie. At first, Alice wouldn't eat anything, but Annie persuaded her. Although she complained of the sweety taste in her mouth, just as she had after eating the sandwiches at Bude. That night, November the 2nd, Alice Thomas fell into a severe relapse. Now she was delirious partially paralyzed, 
and could not move her legs. Dr. Saunders now called in a specialist who felt that the woman displayed the classic symptoms of arsenic poisoning. Alice's condition was now life-threatening. She was rushed to hospital in Plymouth, but never came home. Alice died in hospital on Tuesday, November the 4th. A post-mortem examination revealed 0.85 grains of deadly white arsenic in her body. Clearly, an explanation was needed. Why did Annie Hearn leave the district? What disturbed the peace of a hallowed graveyard one cold, windswept December day? And how did the unexpected use of a 500 pound reward turn a trial on its head. Once the police discovered there'd been arsenic in the body of the deceased, Alice Thomas, they tried to trace its source. Arsenic was freely available in the 1930s as a weed killer. Indeed, Annie Hearn had bought some four years previously. In a small insular community such as Lewanick, gossip was inevitable. William Thomas had somehow gained details of the analyst's findings about the arsenic in his wife's body. He and Annie Hearn were well aware of where the finger of suspicion might point. He told Annie, they'll put the blame on us. The blame will fall heavier on you than on me. People are saying so. And the detective may be here at any time. On November the 10th, and he left Trenhorn, posting a letter to William Thomas suggesting that she was about to take her own life. Dear Mr. Thomas, goodbye. I'm going out if I can. I am innocent. Innocent, but she is dead, and it was my lunch she ate. I cannot stay. When I'm dead, they will be sure I'm guilty, and you at least will be clear. My conscience is clear. I'm not afraid of the afterwards. Thomas took the letter to the police. A description of Annie Hearn was immediately circulated nationwide. But it was Cornish police who found the woman's hat and black and white check coat on a cliff top at Loo in southeast Cornwall. It seemed possible that Annie Hearn had indeed committed suicide, although the police were not convinced and continued their nationwide search. Meanwhile, at an inquest in Plymouth into the death of Alice Thomas, the coroner recorded the cause of death as arsenical poisoning, and the jury recorded a verdict of murder by some person or persons unknown. Once the verdict was out and the coroner had made it public that Alice had been murdered, obviously the police would want to make inquiries about uh, the circumstances surrounding her death, the first person to be spoken to would naturally uh, have been William, the husband, and without question, Annie. Everything pointed towards the fact that Annie had a few questions to answer, and was she avoiding answering those questions? The police stepped up their search for the missing woman now began making connections between the deaths of Mrs. Thomas and the two members of Annie Hearn's family. Detectives noted how many in particular had died of a condition then known as gastric catarrh. And then, of course, there was the elderly aunt. On a bitterly cold, windswept December 9th, 1930, police came here to the churchyard of St. Martin's, Luanic, to erect tarpaulin screens around the graves of Minnie Everard and Aunt Mary just over there. Out of sight of the street, their mortal remains were exhumed. But from properties that overlooked the northern side of the churchyard, villagers had a near perfect view of the unprecedented scenes of men in overcoats collecting tissue samples. The girl that was living in the house with my mother-in-law at the time had been down the village and she said, they're putting screens up in the churchyard because we'd heard some of them about that they was going to exhume these, the sister and the aunt. So we went out and stood on the bank there and could see. And they had 
jars on this box grave. They would dip down somewhere here and come up with like if they had a pair of tongs and then put it in a jar and then go away again, down again, put someone in another jar. And these jars they had on, but what they were putting in, we don't know. You couldn't see what it was. We were too far away for that. By now, Britain's popular press was writing itself into a frenzy. The Daily Mail demanded to know whether Mrs. Hearn was alive or dead and offered what was then an astonishing 500 pound reward for information leading to the discovery of the missing witness. Still more dramatically, in the pathology lab, the tissue samples from both bodies in the Lewanik churchyard were found to contain traces of arsenic. The Home Office analyst stated that the presence of arsenic in Minnie's hair meant that the doses had been administered during the last seven months of her life. Annie Hearn, meanwhile, was not dead. She had left her shoe, hat and coat at Lou and travelled on. Under the assumed name of Mrs Faithful, she had taken up employment in Torquay as a cook housekeeper to Mr Cecil Powell, a local architect. When Mr Powell saw Annie's photograph in the newspapers, he vaguely recognised the woman that he knew as Mrs Faithful. When the housekeeper had a new coat delivered under another false name, Mr Powell had his suspicions confirmed. On January the 12th, 1931, Annie Hearn was arrested and taken into custody. Meanwhile, Mr. Powell, a man of deep Christian values, pondered on how best to spend the 500 pound reward. He decided to donate the money to secure for his former housekeeper the best possible legal representation. In a move that was to change the course of the case, Annie's solicitor was able to engage one of the most eminent barristers of the day, Norman Burkett, KC. The trial opened before Mr. Justice Roach at Bodmin Assizes on July the 15th, 1931. Although charged under two separate counts relating to Minnie Everard and Mrs. Thomas, Annie Hearn was actually tried on the latter count, the murder of her friend and neighbour, Alice Thomas. The jury had to be selected from the western end of Cornwall because feelings ran so high locally. Annie Hearn denied all the charges. But the level of public prejudice against this lonely and mysterious widow with the variety of aliases was such that many observers saw it as a classic open and shut case. Norman Burkett thought otherwise and was determined to convince the jury that Mrs. Thomas suffered from ordinary food poisoning as a result of eating the sandwiches and only later from arsenical poisoning. He maintained there was no proof that Annie Hearn was responsible. Norman Burkett's approach was clearly to uh, suggest that there were alternative explanations uh, for what had been observed. He attempted to show that there was the possibility of food poisoning, uh, conventional food poisoning of some microorganism perhaps in, in, in the tinned salmon. It's very important obviously to make sure that the fish that you can is, is completely clean uh, and it's canned in sterile conditions, but also the integrity of the can is, is very important. There have been very few cases of botulism from uh, canned fish in our lifetimes, but previously it was a well-known problem. And interestingly, in the court case, the managing director of the company acknowledged that it was a problem in those days with canned fish. It would also be quite possible if it was a fault in, in the welding of the can for the contamination to have got into a particular portion of the can uh, and if the fish had not been well mixed with the mayonnaise perhaps it was only on one of the or two of the sandwiches and those are the ones which Alice happened to eat. But even if she had died of food poisoning that didn't explain the arsenic in her body. So the question remained where had the arsenic come from? There are a number of other ways in which the uh, arsenic could have been associated with the samples from the graveyard. Uh, you're, you're dealing with an area of Cornwall uh, which has uh, relatively high arsenic contamination in the soil. Some of it uh, is, is natural because of the mineralisation there. A lot of it comes from old mining activity. And indeed, if there had have been some soil contamination, it would have completely swamped any results from the body parts that they retrieved from the graveyard. So, maybe the arsenic in Alice's body had not been administered deliberately. The Crown still maintained that Annie Hearn had added the weed killer, purchased four years previously, to the salmon sandwiches for the trip to Bude. How would Burkett demolish this theory? The prosecution case had one fatal flaw, and to prove it, he enlisted the aid of the foremost forensic scientist of the day, Sir Sidney Smith, 
and I love the way he did it, um, Sir Sidney Smith actually did the experiment. Uh, and, uh, and as a scientist, of course, that really appeals to me because he, as, as opposed to using theory, he did the experiment. He made these sandwiches in his own hotel room. Sir Sidney Smith knew that all arsenic weed killers uh, had to, by law, contain a purplish-blue dye. Uh, and the clever thing that he did was to reenact the sandwich making. Uh, we've done some experiments here, and uh, initially I thought, well, perhaps you would mix the weed killer in with all of the salmon and, and, and mayonnaise, um, and, and perhaps make two portions of it, one with the weed killer in and, and, and one without. Um, in fact, that doesn't reproduce the effects which Sir Sidney Smith uh, uh, demonstrated. But you do reproduce those effects if you add the weed killer on top of a prepared salmon sandwich. And uh, when you begin to think about it, if you only wanted to kill one of the three people, only poison one of the three people, then that's the way you'd probably do it. You'd make uh, your salmon sandwiches and then you would put a little bit of weed killer on the top of one or two sandwiches. Sir Sidney Smith sliced his sandwiches. Within 30 minutes, the white bread turned an intense blue. Who in their right mind would eat a bright blue sandwich? A previously watertight prosecution case was now beginning to unravel. The prosecution still believed they had found a strong motive for the killing of Alice Thomas. The Crown hinted at a triangular intrigue or a possible attachment between Annie Hearn and William Thomas. When Annie Hearn finally took the stand as the defence's only witness, she was asked directly by Burkitt if there was a word of truth in the suggestion that she killed Mrs. Thomas in order to marry William Thomas. Not an atom, replied Annie. Did you ever conceive a passion, guilty or otherwise, for Mr. Thomas? No. The jury took just 60 minutes to reach a verdict of not guilty. Annie Hearn walked free from the court. Two days later, she traveled north, never to return to Cornwall. Forever blighted by the events surrounding that day trip to Bude, William Thomas fled to a remote farm in Broad Oak in Cornwall, where he died alone, 10 days before Christmas in 1949. Was Annie Hearn a ruthless, calculating serial poisoner? who lied whenever it suited her purposes? Or was she a desperately lonely middle-aged widow who toiled selflessly for others, who fantasized harmlessly, and who had a particular fondness for old-fashioned high tea with salmon sandwiches? The countryside around Lewanick, even on the brightest summer day, can seem very threatening. Who knows what answers still lie buried there? <laughs>